Welcome back to day two of the Spring Into Home series. Today we're talking about organizing, but if you missed the first step, go back and listen to last week's episode on editing or decluttering, whatever you want to call it. I call it editing, some of you call it decluttering, whatever you call it, getting rid of the excess. These are only two of the steps that help us get ready to make our homes beautiful, to make them inviting and warm and welcoming, to make them all the things that we want them to be. We can't miss these two steps. And if we do, sometimes it doesn't really matter how pretty our homes are because we will constantly be surrounded by the stuff that bogs us down or the stuff that needs to be put away and organized. So today we're tackling that. We're talking about organizing and why we should do it and then how we should do it. I'm going to give you lots of tips, so go grab that notebook and a pencil, and I will meet you back here. We grew up with the phrase, home is where the heart is, but our culture has shifted, and now the message is, home should be Pinterest perfect. I'm calling BS on that message. Home, it's not about the stuff, it's about the story, and whether you know it or not, your home is a reflection of you and is already saying something. So what is it that you want it to say? Hey, I'm Danny, a former first grade teacher turned home decorator. Going from a dual income to a single income so I could stay home with my babies meant budget, like ramen eating, Goodwill shopping budget. And I learned a few things along the way, like how to bring big style to your home without breaking the bank. And I'm sharing it all with you. Tips, tricks, decor, and design advice so you can learn to tell your story with your style where you can start living free from the Pinterest perfect trap and start living a life of intention. Welcome to Fig and Farm at Home, where we design happy living and where it doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. When I first started planning this episode, I thought, you know what, this might be a quick tip one. And then I started taking notes and notes and notes. And I finally stopped taking notes, but I still have ideas. So let's just hop right to it with the why. Why should we organize? Now, I if you have not listened to last week's episode, I want you to go back. I want you to stop the episode. I want you to go back and I want you to listen to the decluttering, the editing, the getting rid of excess and how you can understand if really your space is serving you or not. And before I forget, and I don't think I mentioned it last week, I developed a quiz for how you can know if your home is serving you or if you're serving your home. And I'm going to put that link in the show notes so that you can have that because I think it's something that if we reflect on these questions that I ask, it might help us to understand our relationship with stuff and the way that stuff makes us feel in our own home. So If you missed last week's, go back and then I'll still be here. We'll be waiting. Okay, so today, why on earth should you organize? Well, I've got seven good reasons. (laughs) And only one of them is because it can make things look pretty. Okay, that's it. That's the first one. It can make things look pretty. Let's move on. That's not why we're here. We know that when we design beautiful spaces and we design spaces that ultimately light us up and we want to invite people home, that is the pretty stuff, right? That's down the road. But yes, organizing can be pretty. It can. You can think about all of the pictures you see on Pinterest, or you see the pictures on Instagram, all of the pantries that are enviable, all of those. That's pretty. That is pretty organizing. And we know that it can happen. So let's move on to number two. Why on earth should you spend some time organizing? And that's because it makes it efficient. Think about if you were in a library, go back to your your childhood library, your college library, even the library when you go check out books nowadays, if you do. I love the library. This is a, a weekly, or it used to be a weekly errand for my boys and I, something that we looked forward to going to. Now that they're bigger, we don't go as often, but in the summertime, we definitely do it more often. Okay, but imagine going into the library and imagine thinking, I want a gardening book. I want to find a yoga video. I want to find it. You name it. You want to find it. If they didn't have the Dewey Decimal System in place, if they didn't have the way that we can 
look on the computer search, by the way, that is still the Dewey Decimal System. But remember those days back when we were teeny tiny and we had to go to the card catalog, open up the card catalog, and then look that way? (laughs) Yep, that way. I am that old that I had to go through and find the paper file that told me where the book was. If they didn't have that, could you imagine there, we would still be stuck in a library. If we went to go find what we were trying to find, we would either leave frustrated, confused, empty handed, angry, you name it. You could fill in the emotion. We would leave that way. And organizing your homes could be very similar. Think for instance, when you go and try to bake a cake or you go and you try to make dinner if you need a certain spice or if you need a, an ingredient, how do you go and find it? Do you put your spices in with your cutlery? Do you put your flour in with your, um, with your dishes? Probably not. You've already started developing an organizational system, but how can we make it even more efficient for you? We can, and I'm going to teach you how in a little bit. But having an organized space helps you be efficient. And efficiency makes it easy to use, which is tip number three, or not tip, but reason number three, why you should organize your space, because it makes it really easy to use. I know that when, when things are efficient, I want to cook more at home. I want to pull out the baking supplies and bake the cakes. I want to do that because it's just easier. It's not as laborious because I'm not digging through things to find the thing, to find the thing, to find the thing that I need to make. (laughs) I'm not doing it. It's just easy. Reason number four why you should organize is because if you have little helpers or even big helpers in the form of partners or siblings, whoever you share your space with, enlisting their help becomes easier because it is easier for them and more efficient for them to find what you're looking for, to help pack the snacks themselves, to put away their own clothes, to um, organize the colors in the laundry bins, whatever it is in whichever organizing system you're using or whichever location in your home, enlisting help becomes easier. I know, for example, when I say, okay, boys, it's time to go and clean, do our our cleaning area for the weekend, I know they can go right to the cleaning supply closet. They're not gathering all the supplies they need. I've gathered them all for them in one little one little space. They grab the little tote and away they go. They don't have to try to find the all-purpose spray. They don't have to find the paper towels or the rags. They don't have to find all these because they're already organized and ready and waiting for their teeny tiny little hands because Lord knows mama needs some help. The fifth reason why you should organize is because it saves you money. Yes, it does. Think about this. I'm in my craft room. I'm in my office. I'm in somewhere where I have a lot of things. And if I'm working on a project and I know I need that special ribbon, but I know I had that special ribbon. I know it was here somewhere, but dang it, I can't find the special ribbon. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and buy more special ribbon bring it home and Murphy's Law tells me that I am going to find the original special ribbon sometime within the week, (laughs) realizing that, shoot, I didn't need to waste time or money and go out going out and buying the second roll of special ribbon. I didn't need to do that. If I would have had my space organized, I would have been able to find it in the first place. I would have known that my special ribbon is in the ribbon jar in my office You can think practically about this when you think about freezers. And if you have a chest freezer or even just a, just, I kind of feel like any freezer, right? Chest freezers get a bad rap, but think about how many times you lose something in the freezer only to find it a while later. And you think, hmm, I forgot I had that in here. Guess what? If it were organized in your space, yes, even in a freezer, if it was organized in that space, you might not have lost it in the first place. If you knew that you had a bread section, a meat section, a dessert section in your freezer, you might have been able to find it when it was time to make the crostinis and you needed the bread because you would have known that it had its own section. You wouldn't have had to go out and buy the bread and then come back. And again, Murphy's Law, you realize, shoot, I had the bread right here all along, the one that I was looking for and I just couldn't find because it was hanging out in my desserts. Are you following me? This can happen over and over. Reason number six for why you should organize Because if you have an organized space, and if you do it in the ways that I'm suggesting today, you're going to have sections and categories for containment. 
And if you exceed those sections and categories, you're going to realize that you are living in excess. And if you're living in excess, that means that generally piles beget piles, beget piles, beget stuff that we step over, beget excess, and beget a home that doesn't necessarily serve us. It ends up being a home that we end up serving, that we end up spending more time trying to dig through and find stepping over piles, moving piles in order to use the space that the space was designed for. And when we have an organized home, we can see the excess a little more quickly. We can be in tune with the excess just a little bit more than if we didn't have an organized home. And then reason number seven, why you should have an organized home or why I think organizing is a great idea is because it sets the stage for keeping your home tidy. And I know that when we have untidy spaces, it's like a sliding scale, right? I know that sometimes that sliding scale becomes a standard. And I know that if I allow the untidiness to hang out on the stairs every day, hang out on the table every day, hang out on the coffee table every day, hang out wherever it's hanging out. I know that sometimes that can create bad habits, especially if we're modeling them for the kiddos. And I know that sometimes as we drop backpacks, as we drop things, as we drop things on the stairs and we think, oh, I'll pick them up later. If things become untidy, it now becomes a standard, especially for those teeny tiny hands who are trying to teach these good habits too. And then let me go on a little tangent here. When it becomes a standard when we think, oh, we can just drop it here, we can drop it here. When we, when it becomes a standard that, oh, we need to clean before we do X, Y, Z, whatever that thing is, or maybe you don't, but if you do and you say, we need to clean up the Legos before we move on to the next thing, we need to clean up the, the puzzles before we pull out the thing, that then becomes such a chore. And then not only a chore for the kids, but a headache for the parents because the chore now is compounded because we didn't put the things away when we should have, didn't keep it tidy when we should have. And then it becomes kind of a snowball effect of frustration. And the same is true even if you're not living with kids. Imagine if the standard was keeping things, dropping things wherever you want. When it comes time to cleaning, which is what we're going to be talking about next week, when it comes time to clean, you actually have to organize before you get to the cleaning before you get to the things that just have to be done on a regular basis, whatever your regular is, the mopping, the dusting, the sweeping, the vacuuming. If we have to then organize and tidy, it can be a really frustrating thing to have to do that in order to clean. So if you're finding that on cleaning days or cleaning weekends or whatever it is, it's a big, big, big chore. It is bigger than you want to spend. It is more than an hour. Yet, did you hear that? It is more than an hour. If you're finding that it's taking you all day, I want you to think about how tidy your home is first. And if your home is not tidy, then I want you to think about how clutter-free your home is and then work backwards, right? So if you're thinking, gosh, cleaning takes me from eight to seven and I'm still not done, or I have to do all the work all the time in order to host my book club, we're missing a step here and we need to go start at the beginning. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more next week and how, yes, I do think, hear me out, I do think you can do cleaning in about an hour. Okay. Now, if you're living in a mansion, scratch that. (laughs) I'm not living in a mansion. I am living in a multi-bedroom house with multi-bathrooms, but I think it can be done and I'll tell you how next week. So now that you know why it's important, let's talk about how. How do we do it? How do we set up systems that will help keep us efficient? help make it so that it's easy for us to give tasks to the people we share our homes with? How will it be motivating enough to keep it up? I imagine in your home already today, even if you think that you are not an organized person, you have at least two things that are constantly organized or organized-ish. We are going to refer back to these two things as we start practicing this in our own homes. Before I tell you what these two things are, I want you to envision a matryoshka doll. Do you know those? That is the fancy word for them, but they are the stacking dolls, the nesting dolls, the ones that you, you have a big one and you take off, you take the top apart from the bottom and then you reveal another 
nesting doll, another size, and you take off the top and you reveal another size, take off the top and another size. And pretty soon you are down about 10, 12 layers and you have a teeny tiny little doll that you cannot remove any layers from because it's too small. I want you to think about that when we think about these organizing systems. And if you've never seen a stacking doll or Matryoshka doll, I want you to think about nesting tables. Have you seen those? You could Google this. You could look at it on Wayfair. This might be a side table that has a bigger table on top. And then underneath is another little table and then another little table. They generally come in sets of three, which is what we're going to talk about today. Something that is a set of three. So imagine that as I tell you this. We are going to think organizing in terms of nesting tables. When we start with something big and we go down to something small. When we start with something uh, broad category and we narrow it down into more and more and more specific. So the two things that you probably have in your home right now that is already automatically doing this for you and setting a really good example are the refrigerator and your utensil drawer. So let's talk about each one first so you can get the idea. Broadly speaking, your utensil drawer is just that. We can label it. We know that it's a drawer. It is one single space. Inside of that utensil drawer, I'm imagining you probably do not just throw in your forks, your spoons, your knives. You don't do that. I'm imagining you might have a utensil tray. You know, one of the ones that has the little slots for all the utensils. And now you get it. Each one has a little slot for all the utensils. So you know you have a section for your salad forks, your dinner forks, your spoons, your knives. You might have another section for something else. Maybe you have corn cob holders. Maybe you have your soup spoons. Maybe you have your serving spoons. Whatever you have that in another little section. These are all categorized into small categories. And this is keeping you honest, really, organizationally. It's keeping you honest because you have started with something broad, like the utensil drawer. You have narrowed it down to your fork area. And I know that if my forks don't fit in that fork area, I probably have too many forks. This is the same principle that we're going to apply in bigger areas. So let's talk about the refrigerator first. The refrigerator is very similar, right? The broad category is food storage. We know that we have this wonderful thing called a refrigerator and it has food storage. If I open up my refrigerator, I know that I have categories already established inside. I have a drawer for cheese and meats. I have a drawer for vegetables. I have a drawer for fruits. Do you see how the refrigerator and the utensil drawer are in alignment a little bit with the nesting table, with the Matryoshka doll? We start with a big category and we narrow it, narrow it, narrow it down until it's smallest. And that is how we organize. So let's give some practical ideas and give you some tips for how to do it well. Let's take my pantry, for example. I know that if the reason I want to be organized is to keep things efficient, easy to use, easy to find, make it user friendly for everyone else, and not even pretty, but I just want to make it easier to use. I know that in my pantry, which is the broad category, I open it up and I have subcategories already. And those subcategories are called the shelves. Do you have pantry shelves in yours? Awesome. How am I going to make that even a little bit more narrow and a little bit more specific? I'm going to assign each of those shelves a job. And on each of those shelves, I'm going to make little sections that make my food storage even more efficient. And why do I want efficiency? I want efficiency because I want the boys to start packing their own lunches. I want them to know where to find their snacks. I want, if grandma and grandpa come over and they're responsible for dinner, I want them to be able to easily find the things in order to prepare it. Grandma loves to bake things when she's here and I want her to have access to the baking supplies. She'll know where they are if she sees them in the subcategories within the broader categories in my pantry. Here's an example of how it works. One shelf is designated the breakfast shelf. And as you can imagine, we've got some breakfast items on it. About a third of that shelf is designated just for cereal. Because you guys, have you heard? I have three boys. <laughs> we go through that stuff like I don't even know what. It is just so quick. So a third of that shelf is designated for all the cereals. The boys know that when they open the pantry, the cereal is not going to be with the chips. It's not going to be with their snacks. It's not going to be with the oils and the baking things. It's going to be in the cereal section on the breakfast shelf. 
Now, by the way, these aren't labeled. If you are really loving labels, if you love your label maker, label them. Especially if you have little ones, it can be really helpful. We don't need to do that. We just know that this is where the items go. We have some instant oatmeals and those I have put into a little basket, a little storage basket. I take them out of the box, put them in there, and they're easy to grab ready for little fingers to prepare for themselves. And then on my breakfast shelf is also all of the hot drinks. This takes up the majority of the shelf, if I'm being honest. This is where the cocos are, the cider, the tea, the extra coffee. This is where they live. Now, I know that if I had the original boxes of all of these things, it would take up quite a bit of space. So I have a basket. And that basket is separated kind of like a utensil drawer. It has little containers inside. And I have one container that holds all of the cocoa, one container that holds all of the cider packets, and one container that holds the tea. Now I know two things. This allows me to see what's available. So I know when I'm getting low on cocoa or cider, especially in the winter time, my boys love to have that drink in the morning time. And if I'm getting low, I can see it. It's a little bit easier and it makes my shopping list a little bit easier to make. But the other thing is, it's efficient. If those boys sleep in and they want cocoa before school, they can reach into the basket, they don't have to fumble through the box, and it's right there for them. And seeing it allows me to know if I have too much. Because I can see what is available, I know that I don't need to buy any more. And when you land into that that cycle of buying more when you think you might need it, but you actually don't need it, that is when we have excess. If I don't have space to store it, I don't need it. This same principle applies when it comes time to clothing storage, where it gets a little bit tricky and ambiguous with linen storage, with your coat closet, even in your garage, <laughs> which is a beast, or office spaces, playrooms, craft rooms, sewing rooms, those places that could hold a lot of little parts. If you think about it in terms of broad categories and narrowing it down into specific categories for storage and organization, it becomes a lot easier to manage and keep track of and to understand if yes, in fact, you need more or you don't, you have plenty. Going back to the pantry example, without being super specific for you and what is itemized on each shelf, I do have those subcategories. Again, those subcategories are the shelves. And I have, you already know about the breakfast shelf. I have a dinner shelf. I have a snack shelf. I have a shelf that is designated for extra serving trays. Within each shelf, I've become a little bit more specific just like I did with my breakfast shelf. I know I have a section for cereals. I know I have a section for drinks. I know I have a section for instant oats. Same thing for my dinner shelf. I have categorized the dinner shelf so that I can find things easier. A basket for pastas and sauces, a basket for Mexican food, glass containers containing a lot of different grains, popcorn, rice, brown rice, quinoa. All of those are aligned on the dinner shelf. And you can keep going to each subcategory, each shelf, the snack shelf, the extra servingware shelf. All of these are easily identifiable when I open up the pantry door because they're categorized in a subcategory like dinner shelf, breakfast shelf, snack shelf, and within each shelf are subcategories, making it super specific and easy to find. The same idea can apply to a lot of different areas of your home, to your dressers, to linen closets, to bathroom storage, closets, playrooms, office spaces, garages even. You get the idea. We've mentioned these, these broad areas before. We've spent most of our examples in the kitchen, but what happens if you need to organize something a little daunting, something a little bit, a little bit more nuanced in space, a little bit more demanding, like a craft room? As I go through these steps, I want you to write down so that when it's time for you to go through and organize one area of your home, you know which steps to follow. So there's three steps. The very first step is to start by editing. Yes, I know we, we did it last week. <laughs> but seriously, if you are serious about going through and organizing a space, start by editing. Now, if you have lots of time, start by taking out everything. Last week, I did a bookshelf training bookshelf style training and 
that is the first thing we do. We start by removing everything. And we do that for a reason. Because sometimes when you put things back, it makes it so that you hold it in your hand and you realize, do I really need that? Do I want it? Do I use it? Do I like it? You ask all those questions as quick as a wink. And sometimes you're able to make a quick decision. So sometimes you only get a few things gone. Sometimes you realize, gosh, I actually don't need all the stuff. Like in the case of this craft room. I know that as I'm going through and I'm thinking, as I'm really wanting and craving a little bit more space, I know I need to get rid of some stuff in order to make that space work better for me. So that is really the very, very first step. Now, I also know that sometimes getting everything off the shelves and out into the open is a step that is really for the diehards, right? That's not always easy. It's not always practical. And it's not always the best use of your time. But can you go through can you go through your space in order to edit without doing it? And if you can, great, then don't empty things in the middle of the room. (laughs) But in the case of my craft room, that is something that yes, I'm going to go through one cupboard at a time, one shelf at a time, I'm going to look at everything, I'm going to decide, do I really need it? I am not doing it all at once because that would be a lot of stuff and completely overwhelming. Okay, step one, that's it, you edit. Yes, Danny, I get it, you edit, you edit, you edit. Yes, sister, we edit, we edit, we edit. (laughs) We do, and it's something that honestly, it is never a one and done. You are never done because the more you bring into your home, the more you need to get rid of. Okay, step two, this is where the meat and potatoes is. So I want you to think about what you use the space for. And you're going to think about that in terms of categories. We already know we are in the broad category called our craft room, just like we were in the broad category called our pantry earlier. Great, we got the first step. We are in the craft room. Now what? We're going to break that craft room down into subcategories. And I want you to think about all of the activities that you do in here. Not the ones that you want to do, but the ones that you do in here. Now, the ones that you want to do, here's a question I need to ask you. Do you want to do those and you have the supplies for it and you just don't get to it? Is this one of those someday things? And if it is, chances are those things need to go into the edit pile. Get them out because they're not happening. So what are you actively using the room for? and write all those categories down. Now, for me, I wrote down some categories. I have sewing happening in here. I have paper crafts. I have gift wrapping. And I'm also going to put my office supplies because even if it's my craft room, it is still my office storage. I'm going to spend some time really thinking about each category of things. So when it comes time for sewing, I'm going to actually make a list and I'm going to title that list exactly that, sewing. I want to write down all of the things that I have that make up this space. I know that I have three sewing machines. I know, I know, I do. But I have one that's mine, I have one that's my mom's, and I have a, I have a serger. And then I have material. I also have a bin of notions. I have a bin of patterns. I have lots of thread. You get the idea. I have a lot. And so as I'm thinking about all of the things that I currently have, sometimes getting it down on paper is also another form of editing. And it might be something where I realize, you know what, I do have a lot of thread, but I don't actually think I need all that thread. I don't think I need 15 yellows. Thank you, mom. (laughs) I don't think I do, but I think I need maybe three. I'll keep three yellows. That's going to help edit as well. And then I'm going to do that with every category. For my paper crafts, my paper crafts are a little bit trickier because this is this is paper, this is washi tape, this is all of my writing utensils, these are the scissors, these are the glues, these are the cutting boards, these are the cutting mats, these are all the things. And so there's going to be several subcategories within this little category. Over in my office supplies, that's going to be another one. Part of my office supplies are the things I'm doing right now, podcasting. I have my computer, I have my printer, I have my microphone, I have extra supplies like staples and pens and scissors and those things. And then I have my gift wrapping station. What is it that comprises my gift wrapping station? I have my tape, I have my scissors, I have my gift wrap, I have my ribbon. All of those things make up the category of my gift wrapping. Now, with each of these, I'm going to take a really hard look at how much space I actually need for these things. How much space do I need for my sewing? 
out of all of these things, I know that sewing is going to take up quite a bit of space. I know my paper supplies are going to be the next category that is I'm going to need more space for, and then my office supplies, and then my gift wrapping last. So as I think about and plan what areas I'm going to place these items in, I need to allot an appropriate amount of space. I'm not going to allot a whole lot of space for gift wrapping because I don't have a whole lot. And some of those things that you heard me list are going to land in my paper crafts, like tape and scissors, for example. So as I'm thinking about how much space I need for my sewing, I'm going to look at the things I currently have in use in my craft room office area. I currently have a closet with hanging space and four shelves. I have three Ikea Kallax bookshelves. Those are the ones that have the cubbies. We did an Ikea hack and added doors to the front with some caning in there to make them look a little bit more elevated so that you couldn't see the cubbies and all of the supplies hidden behind the closed doors. I know too that I have a desk and on my desk I have two shelves. So I do have quite a bit of storage, but that's it. That is it. I don't have any more and I don't want any of this stuff to spill over into other areas of the home. So from this storage, I'm going to assign different areas for my categories. I'm going to assign an appropriate amount of space for my sewing, an appropriate amount of space for my paper crafts, and so on. The trick here is this, and it's very similar to my pantry organizing, like I shared earlier. I know that I have that section just for cereal, and if I have more cereal than that section, guess what? I have too much cereal. The same thing applies here. I know that I have a pretty generous section already set aside for my sewing. And if my sewing supplies ever exceed that space, I don't go and look for more space. What do I do? I get rid of things. That's another form of helping to keep our spaces edited. You assign a section, an appropriate section, and then you edit what's left. One thing that is really important is making sure that you at the very beginning, you allot enough space, appropriate enough space. I know that if I allowed myself one shelf, for example, for sewing, that's not realistic. I have, you heard me say, I have three sewing machines. <laughs> I need space for three sewing machines. I'm not ready to get rid of my mom's and I'm not ready to get rid of the serger. I, I will have three for a while until I don't. Now that you have your categories aligned with the spacing that you're going to give it, now is the time to really think about how you can place these in the areas that make it efficient, easy to use, that sets the stage for keeping things tidy, that saves you money so that you can find them, all of the things for the reasons why we are organizing in the first place. One of the ways that you're going to do this is by thinking now in subcategories to those categories. For example, with my office supplies, I know I'm going to need an area for my writing utensils. I'm going to need an area in a storage system for my paper. I'm going to need a section for my scrapbooks and my tapes. I'm going to need a section for all of those things, but I want them to be accessible. I don't want to throw them behind the shelves in one box that I have to jumble through. I'm going to want small things, small storage containers that will help me keep them easily accessible to see what I have and to make it efficient to use. Things like baskets, jars, cups, plastic bins, canvas bins, you get the idea. Sometimes though, if we think about organizing all of the small things, those subcategory things into all these beautiful containers, the ones that we see on Pinterest and Instagram, and if, and if that is our ideal, that can add up. And so here is a quick list of ways that you can utilize things that you already have in order to make containers and space for the little things that are subcategories within your broader category. Boxes after a trip to Costco, Amazon boxes or things that ship from the UPS, Kleenex boxes, cereal boxes, shoe boxes, even tin cans. Now it might not be something that's really pleasing to you to look at when you think, gosh, this orange Nike box is super inspiring. <laughs> But do you have some craft paper? Do you have some gift wrap paper that you can turn inside out and wrap it in? Do you have some washi tape that you can decorate that gift wrapping in? Do you have some duct tape that you can duct tape it? It doesn't have to be fancy. It just needs to be purposeful, useful, help your job of organizing and becoming efficient easier. And when you can start to afford some of the 
cutie patootie little storage bins, start first at the dollar store or a thrift store. See what you can find. And if you get something matchy matchy, bonus. The point here is to just start. Okay, and then the third thing that you can do is to think vertically. Anytime you're organizing your space, wherever it is, I want you to look at your vertical options. Sometimes we have so much underutilized space because we don't think up, we only think out. Or we only think up as high as whatever it was sitting on the shelf. So here are some ideas of how I've thought vertically in my home, and I want you to think vertically too. Behind cupboards, behind closet doors, on closet doors. I want you to think vertically in closets. I want you to think vertically in cabinets. Think vertically in spaces that you might not have thought vertically before. So here are the places where I've thought vertically in my home. I have risers in cupboards. I have them underneath bathroom sinks. I have costumes and hats and belts hung on hooks hanging on the wall. I have behind the door storage. In my closet, I have hooks that hang backpacks and extra purses. In my craft closet, I have hanging storage for the gift wrapping station, each with its own little section for holding tape and ribbon. Honestly, this is one of my favorites, and I don't know why I didn't think about this one sooner, because it's everything's out in the open. I don't have to climb in the back of the closet to get anything. I don't have to dig around with the spiders in the garage to get the gift wrap out. It's super easy and efficient and so, so useful. I've thought vertically in the kitchen by mounting wine racks underneath the kitchen cabinets. And one of my latest changes in order to make my home be a little bit more efficient and work for me a little harder than it is, is actually in the garage. You've heard me say that recently I've been going through simultaneously two rooms in my in my home. One, of course, is my office and still a work in progress. This is taking weeks and my garage still a work in progress taking weeks, but I have a deadline. I have a client piece arriving on Sunday. I need to get that thing done. But in the garage, I took all of the Nerf guns and we have plenty, more than I can count, more than I think we need. And I took them out of the wagon, which the wagon, of course, is just sitting on the floor. The wagon the boys have stopped using years ago. It became a nice little cubby hole for all of these wonderful little Nerf guns and their little bullets. But recently I took them out and I built a vertical storage system for the guns. It was so much fun to show the boys what I had created and to see little Charlie light up and want to help me put the pegs on the pegboard and to hang his guns. He organized it, I didn't. And the beauty of this is that because it is pegboard, I can have those little pegboard storage hooks and those can be moved as guns are added or subtracted or moved around. But going vertically instead of um, just leaving them in the wagon on the ground creates space on the floor. And that is what we're desiring in that garage. We need more floor space. We need areas to work and to make it efficient so that when it's time to build something, Greg has a space to pull out the table saw, to bring out the sander, to bring out all the things he needs in order to build the masterpiece that he's going to be building. That, my dears, is the beauty of organizing. And backing up to the story of having Charlie help me, he lit up when I organized these. He could finally see his guns. He could finally have access to them, and he was so excited. They are front and center in the garage, the first thing you see if you the open garage door, and they are accessible. They are right there so that when they are wanting to play, lift up the garage door, and away they go. That isn't the first time I've made space and made toys and games and puzzles more accessible for the kids, made it a little bit more efficient for them to use, a little bit easier for them to put away when they're done, and not the first time that they've lit up with that change. It's not the first time, and I think sometimes we think we can provide for our kids all the things, but what they really want is to be able to see the things, to play with you with the things. And honestly, this is a point of conversation for another time. So we're going to save that for a rainy day. And today's not the day. So girls, so many reasons why we should organize our homes. As a recap, it makes things efficient, easy to use, easy to enlist the help of others when it's time to tidy up, help around the house. It saves you money because you already know that you have the thing because you know exactly where the thing is. It can look pretty. It sets the stage for editing when you're bringing new things and keeping things tidy in the future. 
How you do it is a little more complex, but if you start with editing, that's a great start. And then you think broad categories like pantries, refrigerators, laundry rooms, bathrooms, whatever your broad category is, you're going to break up subcategories of the things that are happening within each space, assigning appropriate amount of space for storing the supplies to make those activities happen, and then storing them with efficiency so that they are easy to use, easy to see, easy to grab, easy to facilitate someone else grabbing and putting away. And that's when it comes into the pretty things, the baskets, the cans, the jars, all of the little things. And we don't want to forget, we want to think about our space vertically. How can we use vertical space in order to create more opportunities for storing things efficiently? Ultimately, the name of the game, the idea here is to not store more. It is to store it well. And when you do that, you are creating the foundation for a home that not only serves you well, that will have the space to look beautiful too. And really quick before I go, did you know that if you are already a subscriber to my newsletter, that you sometimes get information that other people don't? Did you know that? (laughs) Yes, it's true. Early bird discounts, open registrations early, sometimes sales that only my newsletter subscribers know about, codes get discounts, and of course, all the tips. And sometimes you hear stories that you might not hear from here. So if you're wanting to make sure that you don't miss a thing, send me an email, home at gmail.com, and ask to join the newsletter list, and I would be happy to add you. All right, girls, until next time, I hope you're well. Hey, real quick before you go, if you learned something new or found value in today's podcast, would you head over to iTunes to Fig and Farm at Home and leave a review and subscribe to the show? That would be awesome. And if you'd like to connect with my community of mamas who are learning to be intentional storytellers within their own homes, join us at bit.ly forward slash design 101 group. There's always more room at the table. See you soon.